This is the third in a series that I've been doing based on using the analog discovery to recreate a number of experiments from modern electronic communication by Beasley and Miller. This experiment is one involving pulse time modulation and demodulation. Now by pulse time what we mean is that either the width of the pulse is varied, called pulse width modulation, or the position of the pulse in time is varied, called pulse position modulation. Pulse width modulation is often abbreviated PWM. Pulse position modulation is often abbreviated PPM. I have the analog discovery hooked up. Once again, I am using the analog discovery only to provide the carrier signal and the intelligence signal for the experiment, which we'll talk about in a second. For reasons that I will go into later, I am not using the analog discovery oscilloscope functions in, in this particular experiment. Here is the circuit that we're using. It uses a 565 phase lock loop. The carrier signal is input on this side and the intelligence signal on this side. This is connected to AWG2 of the analog discovery and the carrier signal is connected to AWG1. The 565 has been around a very, very long time. In fact, this is a book that I bought in 1977 and I built one of the circuits in this book, which you see down here. It is a radio teletype demodulator that uses an NE 565 phase lock loop. Here is the schematic that I drew. I don't know if that's going to show up very well on this camera or not. It looks like it's not going to. Uh, the There we are. This is the schematic. And at the risk of uh, being permanently banished to the dinosaur den, this was one of my first computer uh, hobby experiments. This is the uh, interface board that I used on a computer I'm sure that no one today has ever heard of called an Ohio Scientific. At the time, it was the sort of coming thing. It was based on a Motorola 6502, I believe. At any rate, what this did is it would decode radio teletype signals by converting the audio output of a shortwave radio into a digital signal that could then be decoded. So I only show you this because it gives you an indication of how far back this 565 really goes. Now you can buy a lot better phase lock loops today. This one only goes up to, I think, maybe a megahertz or maybe not even that high. The, of course, phase lock loops today are used in, in almost all kinds of applications. You can buy chips that go up into the gigahertz. The way that the phase lock loop works is based on three parts. There is a voltage controlled oscillator. There is a phase detector. And there is an amplifier to uh, uh, basically isolate the VCO. Without getting into too much PLL detail, the fundamental uh, issue is that you can either use a VCO to lock to a frequency or you can lock the VCO to a standard frequency and then it will output a value, a DC level that is proportional to how far off your input frequency is. So suppose you have a 10 megahertz reference, you bring in a 10 megahertz signal that say is coming from a, a less stable source the output from the phase detector will show you how far off 
your incoming signal is from the reference signal. In this particular case, that's sort of the application that we're using. Fundamentally, we lock this to, uh, in this case, I'm using 20 kilohertz, a 20 kilohertz basic VCO frequency, and a 20 kilohertz uh, carrier input. And I'll show you those in a minute on the uh, analog discovery. Then we input a 2 kilohertz sine wave as the intelligence signal. And in a minute I'll show you what that does and how you can uh, how you can use that to produce both pulse position modulation, PPM, and pulse width modulation, PWM. But first, let's set up to look at the uh, analog discovery. Here is the computer screen for the computer connected to the analog discovery. At the top is arbitrary waveform generator 1. At the bottom is arbitrary waveform generator 2. You may notice that the signal from 1 is a square wave at a frequency of 20 kilohertz. The signal at the bottom is a sine wave at a frequency of 2 kilohertz. This is the carrier. This is the intelligence signal. I discovered one deficiency with the uh, analog discovery. It's really not the fault of the analog discovery, but it has to do with the use of this voltage supply, which you see up here. It's supposed to supply plus 5 volts and minus 5 volts. And you set these up. Uh, if you want it to work, you put this to ready, as this one is down here. And then you click up here for power, and it turns on whichever ones of these have been readied. It turns those on, and you should be able to use that to supply this pulse time modulation uh, circuit. Unfortunately, it hardly ever works. The reason is that in the first place it takes all of its power out of the USB and the problem with USB is that it uh, is in most computers doesn't supply very much current and when the uh, analog discovery sees that it's having trouble supplying the current. It assumes that that's due to an overcurrent condition. I think it's actually more that the particular computer that I have this plugged into, and I've tried two different ones. One is a, uh, is a tower a desktop kind of computer. The other is a laptop. Neither one of them supplies enough USB power to really run the analog discovery. So that's the reason why in this experiment you probably noticed I only use regular power supplies instead of the analog discovery. There might be some experiments and some computers that you could use this with that would work, but I had uh, bad luck trying to use the, uh, the voltage supplies in the analog discovery. Again, we're using the Tektronics for the uh, oscilloscope. And in this particular experiment, there's a reason other than just uh, how well it shows up on the camera. This particular uh, experiment is sensitive to loading, particularly on the VCO output. And so you really do need to use 10x probes to properly display. On the bottom is the VCO output, and you notice that it's, uh, it's stable. The, at the top is the intelligence signal, but I have it turned off right now, and I'll show you why in a second. The analog discovery, unfortunately, its inputs have a little too much loading to work really well on this experiment. Uh, I, I think there's a solution to that, which I, I may uh, look at later. But for now, I'm just going to continue to use the Tektronix oscilloscope. Now I'm going to turn on the carrier signal. And what will happen is this signal will lock to the carrier frequency. In other words, this is the free-running frequency. When we turn on AWG now, off, on, off, on, you may notice a slight change in this.
the frequencies are so close that there's very little difference between the two. Uh, but basically with the carrier signal input, the VCO is now locked to the carrier. That can be important here in a minute. And for those of you that are used to pulse width modulation on a, uh, an Arduino, for example, where you drive an LED and use PWM to adjust the amplitude or the light output of the LED, this is somewhat similar. The difference is, though, with an Arduino, you're not using a carrier at all. You are simply switching a DC level on and off and varying the on time to basically produce a, an LED that's on for a short period of time and then off for a short period of time and back on. In this case, it's not a DC level we're switching. It's actually a carrier that we're switching on and off. So now let me switch on the intelligence signal. And you see it up at the top. You may notice that what is happening is that the carrier is being shifted. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the, uh, the, the trigger to channel 1. That's the intelligence signal. What is happening is, as the intelligence signal is varying, so is the position of or the phase of the uh, carrier. More importantly, the width of the carrier pulses are varying. Let me see if we can see that a little better this way. You notice that these pulses are uh, smaller than, for example, this pulse and that pulse, which basically reflect the intelligence signal in the width of the pulse output. So this is, in effect, pulse width modulation, but in order to operate correctly, what we have to do is now connect this signal with the carrier signal we saw earlier using an exclusive OR. Let me show you how we're going to do that. Okay, back to the schematic as I indicated. What we're going to do using this exclusive OR, 7486, which of course produces an output when its inputs are different. This is a square wave at 20 kilohertz and we're applying that to one input of the exclusive OR and we are applying the VCO output through a level converter to convert it to 5 volts to the other input. So we basically are exclusive ORing the carrier and the VCO output. Remember the VCO output is being varied by the intelligence signal. The carrier is pure. Now I've added a third channel to the Tektronics and the third channel is connected to the output of the exclusive OR gate that I showed you a little earlier. Now let me run a little faster on the switch speed and you can start to see how the pulse widths vary. You'll notice that as the wave gets bigger, the input wave or the intelligence signal, the pulse width goes from the normal width to a wider width and an even wider width and then over here, a still wider width. In fact, it gets to the point where the off time for the pulse is very, very slender. Then the pulses start getting smaller as, it, as the wave starts moving, the intelligence wave starts moving back toward uh, zero. That is pulse width modulation using a carrier. In other words, it's the carrier that we are uh, modulating by allowing a portion of the carrier through for a wider or narrower period of time. Okay, now let's move on and talk about demodulating this signal. This is the chip we're going to use to demodulate our pulse width modulation. It's an MC1496 it's basically a Gilbert cell. 
Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Gilbert cells, they are a balanced modulator that was originally developed by a fellow named Jones who patented this circuit back in the 70s, I think 1975. Later it was adopted by a designer in analog devices named uh, Barry Gilbert and throughout the industry, although I think Barry will freely admit that he didn't invent this cell, but everyone calls it a Gilbert cell because he's the one that really made it popular. If you'd like a little review on Gilbert cells, uh, what I suggest you do is look at the videos by W2AEW. Alan has done a couple of excellent videos on what a Gilbert cell is, how it works, how it can be used for modulating, particularly uh, double sideband and suppressed carrier and things of that sort. Before we actually look at how we're going to use the 1496, it might be helpful to review what this uh, what this modulation is all about. And so this diagram might help. At the top is the intelligence signal. Below it is a carrier pulse. And below that is the pulse width modulation and the pulse position modulation. Let's talk about this one first. Here you may notice that the distance between pulses varies. Compare this one to this one for example. But the width of the pulse stays the same. With pulse width modulation, the distance between pulses changes, but the width of the pulse also changes. Compare this one, for example, to that one. So those are the two forms of modulation that together form what is called pulse time modulation. And one of the reasons that we use time modulation instead of uh, by the way, frequency modulation, phase modulation, those are all time modulations because if you think about it, like on an oscilloscope, the, the time axis is also the frequency axis, the period axis, the phase axis, etc. The x, uh, I'm sorry, the x axis. The y axis is the amplitude axis. And so when you're doing amplitude modulation, you're modulating along the vertical axis of the oscilloscope. Amplitude modulation is much more subject to noise and interference than phase, frequency, and time modulation. So the reason that time modulation is so popular is once again because it's far more uh, resistant to interference, noise, etc. So now let's look at how we're going to use that 1496 to demodulate these uh, pulse time modulation waveforms. Here's the circuit that we're going to use the 1496 in to decode pulse width modulation. The carrier is input on this input and of course uh, comes to pin 10 uh, of the 1496. The PWM signal is AC coupled to uh, pin 1, which is uh, set up to be uh, symmetric, you notice that this point is AC ground. It's 1 kilo ohm DC away from ground, and then that is coupled through these 1K resistors. So this is basically a balanced input. We're using one side for the, uh, the positive side of the PWM, and of course we're using ground for the other side, but, but offset by this 1K resistor and the 1K balancing resistor. The, uh, we're powering this point, biasing it if you want to see it that way, by a network that works off the 5 volts here, heavily decoupled, and then filtered again and coming down through this, so that basically we have about 5 volts at this point, and the uh, this 680 ohm resistor and this 1K resistor form a voltage divider to bias this point to about 2.5 to 3 volts. It's really not terribly critical. 
but uh, we will see that the bias level at this point will affect the operation of the 1496. So here's the intelligence input. Once again, we have a bias signal on pin 5, and the important thing about this bias is it's related to this bias. And we'll look at that in a minute because the gain of a Gilbert cell is dependent on the bias. If there is zero bias on a Gilbert cell, it has no gain. The output of the Gilbert cell is on pin 12 and is fed through a Pi filter to the output here. Pin 12 is what is on channel 2 of the oscilloscope here. Pin 1 is the intelligence, original intelligence signal, uh, which in this case is a 30 hertz sine wave. And as you can see, the uh, modulator, which actually in this application is really working as a product detector. It's, it's taking the, uh, the PWM signal, which is basically the sideband information, and it is multiplying it by the carrier to produce the waveform you see here. Now if we filter that waveform, we get the signal shown here, which when we superimpose it on the original signal shows that we're getting an accurate reproduction of the original intelligence signal. So that concludes the experiment on pulse time modulation. However, I'm going to do another segment because earlier I told you that I was not using the analog discovery as an oscilloscope because it does not have by 10 input attenuation. In other words, it, oh, it loads high impedance circuits because it's basically a by 1 input. I have since acquired and tested a device that makes up for that and I'll show you that in the next segment. This is a device you can buy from Digilant that plugs into the inputs of the uh, analog discovery or the input connector, reproduces the pins on the other side and provides BNC connections for the two scope inputs and for the two arbitrary waveform generator outputs. You, uh, it has a couple of options. You can choose to either have AC or DC coupling on each channel with some jumpers here in the back. On the AWG uh, channels you can either choose a 50 ohm output or you can choose what they call a 0 ohm output but really what that means is it's open. In other words there's no uh, terminations on the output, it's just whatever the output impedance of the analog discovery uh, is. So let me now hook that up to the analog discovery and then show you how you can use this with some scope probes which I've attached down here and compensated to basically get by that, uh, that by one problem or loading problem that you have with the basic analog discovery. I've hooked up the uh, BNC adapter for the uh, analog discovery there. And on the right are two oscilloscope probes. Now this does not come with any probes or cables. It just comes as is. So I added these uh, BNC uh, oscilloscope probes and these BNC cables. Right now channel 1 is connected to the PWM signal. That was one of the signals that earlier when you, I tried to use the analog discovery, if I connected it there, it would load it down too much and disrupt the operation. Now that I'm using a by 10 probe, as you can see from the scope, we have the same 
signals that we had before. That is, at the top is the input, and at the out, this is the output of the demodulator after filtering. Now, let's take a look at the analog discovery. And what we have here at the top is the same arbitrary waveform generator we've been using. And then overlaying that slightly is the oscilloscope uh, input which is showing the PWM signal. And there you see the pulse width modulation that's going on on the oscilloscope. Now one, uh, actually there are two downsides to using this device. One of course is that because you have a by 10 probe you have to lower the sensitivity or I should say raise the sensitivity, lower the millivolts per division so that it no longer reads the exact figure. This should be 2 volts per division and it is but it says 200 millivolts because of the by 10 probe. The second drawback is that when you plug this unit in it disconnects the inputs that are substituted for the B and C. There's nothing really wrong with that except what it means is that you cannot use the regular arbitrary waveform generator connections you have to use the BNC connectors because these are no longer connected to the analog discovery. And that's the reason why you see that I've had to add two BNC cables. If that were not true or if there were a jumper on the board that would let you either choose to use the old uh, wired connections or the new BNC connections, I think that would be an improvement. But otherwise I'm very happy with the uh, this addition. It solves a problem that I was having with loading and I think I would recommend that if you're going to be working on high impedance circuits I'd go ahead and get one of these BNC adapters for your analog discovery. Well that wraps up pulse time modulation and the use of the analog discovery in those experiments. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll join me for perhaps another one of these experiments in the future.